I woke up this morning and was like, wow, there is hope for cooler weather. The like fall is on the way. Football season is on the way. <laughs> you now I get some cheers out of that. <laughs> All right. Good stuff. Good morning. Feel free to come on in and find your seat again. Last week, uh, we began to speak about um, Purposed, which is the August sermon series here. There's a, a few of these on the back table there, and not only does it have this cool graphic on the front, but it also gives some of the upcoming events that are happening here over the next couple months for families and just some different things uh, that are happening here. Special meetings are on the back of that. So they're on the back table there. If you want to grab some, feel free to do so. Uh, last week, you heard me speak about how God has never purposed one person to live outside the glory-rich environment of his kingdom. Amen. Come on. We looked at how every person was created to dwell in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We saw how man, as mankind, many times we do not know the things that would make for our peace. And we talked about how Jesus was standing over Jerusalem and says, man, you do not know the time of your visitation. And he's weeping as he cries out over Jerusalem saying, you do not know the things that make for your peace. And, you know, we talked about how sometimes as mankind, our best laid plans and our best, our best ideas can often not turn out as intended. And yet when we seek God's kingdom first, God has this uncanny ability to make all things work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so we, we also saw how the Bible shows us the impact on people's lives who came into relationship with Jesus and what they started to do differently, what they, how they started to live differently. And it, it kind of gives us you know, a, a little bit of a pattern or a little bit of a blueprint of what the kingdom of God looks like, how they continued steadfastly in apostolic doctrine and they continued in fellowship and eating together and praying and praising God and gathering in homes and in the temple together. There was high levels, crazy levels of generosity that were happening in the continual presence of the Lord doing miracles in their midst. And this week, we're going to continue on this purpose theme uh, for this month, and we're going to talk about what God has purposed for each one of us here this morning. And next week, Pastor Allen is back. Uh, he is going to continue on with the pur purpose theme throughout the rest of August, and then we're going to head into uh, new seasons for September. So, um, it's so good to have you here. My name is Merle Shank, one of the pastors here at Newport Church, and uh, it's awesome that you can be here with us this morning. Let's take a moment here to pray uh, before we get into the message. Father, we thank you for your presence here. Jesus, we honor you in our midst, and we're so glad that we can gather together freely. We can get, gather together in this place with friends and with family, with a spiritual family, and enjoy worshiping you enjoy lifting your name high. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name, God, that if people have come in carrying burdens that they're not meant to carry, that those burdens would just begin to fall off of their backs. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord, for freedom. We thank you for victory. We thank you for alignment to your word this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Uh, before we get into it, I just want to say a big welcome back to Shane and Sierra Good. Yeah. Woo! Two of the, I almost said two of the notorious, but it's not the notorious, two, <laughs> two of the Scotland Five, and we welcomed back Stephanie, Matt, and Hannah last week, and so we look forward to next week having a report from you guys uh, together. As For those of you who don't know who the Scotland Five are, there were five of our um, men and women who went to Scotland on internships uh, over the last six months, and so it's good to have you guys back. Awesome. Welcome. Cool. Cool. Um, we're going to get right into it here. Um, you know, we, God has purposed each one of us with, to be in relationship with him. In fact, when we are walking in obedience to, to his commands, the Bible talks about this in as if we are actually positionally with Christ. The Bible tell, tells us that we are predestined or purposed by God for two things. 
In Romans chapter 8, verses 28 to 30, it says this. It says, And we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among, or sorry, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Another scripture that talks about is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Tell your neighbor, say, in Christ. Thank you. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace." So part of the, the idea of being purposed by God, and I want to I tackle something here this morning. I want to talk about predestination, <laughs> okay? How God has predestined us to be with him. Now, I, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to necessarily get into what is called in theological circles the doctrine of predestination, which in my understanding is predetermination, okay, where you know, the, the idea that God causes everything, I want to talk about what the Bible talks about predestination is. So there in Romans um, chapter 8, verse 29, it what are we predestined for? It says that, that we are predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. That's what we're predestined for. And what is, so what, is, what does the term predestined mean? It means predestined. <laughs> Big shocker, right? It means before your destination. That's really what it means. It's before, pre, your destination. And so, which, which means is, uh, you know, today after the service, I'm going to go home. And so right now, I am pre my destination of home. Make sense? So, in Scripture, I want to be clear and, and explain this well because, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, debates and, and all of that. And I want to, about whole, the whole thing of like, well, has God predetermined people to go to heaven and predetermined people to go to hell and and. You know, no, the Bible talks about that it is his will that all men would be saved. And so I want to, I uh, when I say all men, I mean all mankind, right? <laughs> right? We're not just picking on the men here this morning. All mankind would be saved, would come to him. And so uh, an easy way to explain this and, and um, talk about this here this morning is that what if uh, we said this morning, all of you, in these two sections here, in the middle sections, we have predestined you to go to Disneyland. Woo! Sorry, guys. Sorry, sorry. you know, on the sides. You know, but we have tickets underneath all these chairs. And by the way, there's plenty of room here in the middle. And so we're not, you know, you have like for the next five minutes to determine whether or not you're going to come and join the middle section. Right? And that's kind of how it is with the kingdom of God where God says, listen, this is my will. This is what my desire is. This is my heart for mankind. And you can join it. The end is not yet. The eternal judgment has not happened yet. And that's where, you know, that's the, the idea here that I want to communicate to us today is that there, there are many things, and the Bible uses these phrases. It talks about being in 
him or being in Christ. And we're going to look at that this morning because when the Bible talks about being in Christ, there's parts of our lives that can be inside of the will of Christ, to be in Christ, which is the will of the Father, for us to live in, and, uh, you know, like uh, Acts says, where Paul says, in him, tell your neighbor, say, in him, Amen. all right, thank you, in him we live and breathe and have our being. So there is the predetermined heart of the Father for you and I, the predestined heart of the Father for you and I that says, man, I know Todd, you know, the host who was here this morning. I know him. I, ha- I know the, bl- the plans that I think for him. I know, you know, to give him a hope and a future. I, I know Lauren, the one who is leading worship. This I know that, that uh, her calling, her anointing, and, and I know, you know, uh, just every single one of us God knows he has these dreams. He has these thoughts in us. Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us that. And it's like, it's kind of like the, the, the riverbanks of our lives. And we can choose whether we live inside that or outside of that. It's kind of like uh, I, I did a, a message one time at a wedding. I don't know how, how well it went over. But uh, I said, listen, you know, we can, we can live our lives in marriage pre-curse or post-curse, <laughs> you know? When you look at Genesis and you look at, you know, the things that, that God has, uh, how he had set things up in the Garden of Eden and how everything works seamlessly together and, and, and we can live our lives pre-curse, like in the glory of who God has called us to be in unity and in favor and in relationship, or we can live our marriage post-curse after their strife and striving and, you know, fighting. And both of it, we call it marriage, right? All right? But it's up to us whether, where we live our lives in that sense. And so, you know, um, there was a time that... Anyone ever get lost? Okay. All right. Thank you for confessing that. It makes me not feel so bad. There was a time I was archery hunting in the mountains, and I was... I, I got in this area where all of these like dips and valleys were and I got turned around and it was getting dark and I was like I have no clue where I am I have no clue like there was this this you know I had I I had a predestined determination I wanted to go back to the cabin right (laughs) all right but I had no clue how to get there And as the sun goes down and as it gets dark in the woods, I'm sitting there, I'm like, shoot. It was like the second time that I was with Cherie's family. Cherie's my wife. And, um, but this was before we were married. And I was like, I'm going to be that guy (laughs) who like goes out exploring and hunting in the woods and then gets lost and the potential future family in laws are gonna have to like do a search party and find. I don't wanna be that guy. And as I'm standing there thinking, all of a sudden I hear like these, these cattle begin to low. They, they begin to bawl. You know, as the sun goes down, they kind of like, Bruh. I was like, I know where that is. And all of a sudden, like it reorientated me. And I was like, well, I know that I just need to head towards that sound, and I'll come out someplace familiar. And I don't know, I don't don't know how far I had to walk, but it was probably like a half mile or a mile or whatever, and uh, finally came out to a road several miles away from the cabin, (laughs) and then proceeded to trudge my way back to the cabin, trying to think of what am I going to (laughs) say about coming in so late. Anyway, we are here, and we're married, and it was all good. (laughs) so you know there's times in life where we can lose our way even if we have like a predetermined a a, a place where we want to be you know when we are predestined where we're before our destination we can lose our way you know there's a whole lot of things that the bible talks about that are attached to being in christ or being in him Uh, There's verses that talk about the blessings of Abraham and the ability to bless nations are attached to being in him. The Bible talks about complete freedom from sin and its effects by being in him. 
The Bible talks about, like we just read there, you know, we have all spiritual blessings in Ephesians chapter 1. Like God has blessed us with spiritual blessings in Christ, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is spiritual authority the Bible talks about. that we have, You and I have spiritual authority when we are in Christ. Outside of Christ, we don't have spiritual authority. We're like, we can be picked on by the enemy and we have no recourse. But inside of Christ, we have spiritual authority. The Bible talks about us being in Christ. The Bible talks about being us being in God. And in essence, I believe that every area of our lives that we have chosen to submit under God comes under the reign of his kingdom. And though it should not be this way, many times as people, we can kind of like part and parcel that out. Like, well, my spiritual life is under Christ. My spiritual life is under God, but my finances, you know? And, you know, we can, we can or my relationships, or my marriage, or, you know, we, we can have these things where we have not yet submitted our entire life under the lordship and the reign of Jesus. And those parts of our lives are out, wind up being outside of the protection and the, his ability, his uncanny ability, to even take negative things that happen to us and turn it around for our good, as the Bible talks about. So we have the choice to place our lives under his direction, under his purpose, and under his design. He gives that choice to us. Just like you would all have the choice to join the middle section and go to Disneyland. You know? There's, there's that choice that he gives to us. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, it says, For uh, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. So for as many of you have received him, then walk in him. It's actually kind of like two different things. Like you receive him, but then it's the daily choice of our lives to walk in him. And that's part of our walk with the Lord. That's why we grow in, in le- uh, his word, the knowledge of his word. That's why we gather together. Verse 7 says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. So this, what this says to me is, wait, we can, we can, like, we can receive him but not walk in him. We can receive him but not walk in him. And, and the, but the desire of God and, and having his kingdom, the desire of God for our lives and for our hearts is for us to both receive him and walk in him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Listen, sometimes, you know, if we're still struggling with things in our lives that are, you know, that kind of belong to who we are before we came to Christ, maybe we haven't fully submitted those areas to him. Maybe we haven't fully submitted those areas under his lordship. Just a question. Got real quiet there. (laughs) So in Christ, you know, and that's where, you know, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Tell your neighbors, say, all things have become new. Amen. In Christ, there is this reset for our lives. When we come into Christ, there's this reset for our lives where the newness of life, the newness of the purpose of God, the newness of the plans of God, the hope, the joy, the freedom, the victory that we walk in internally becomes ours. Amen. Acts chapter 17, verse 28, we gave reference to it already. It says, for in him we live and move and have our being. And Paul was talking about, you know, as he's dialoguing with the philosophers on Mars Hill. Uh, But really what that is, is like spiritually, you are positioned in Christ. When we are following him, when we are followers of him, and we are living our lives by his principles, by his commandments, spiritually, we are actually positioned with him. This isn't just an idea. It's There is an actual place that you uh, uh, occupy in the spirit realm with 
Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says this. It says, And he raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that, the eight, that in the ages to come, verse 7, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. See, there's this place where as believers, we need to examine ourselves. The Bible says examine yourself to make sure that you are still in the faith. There's this place where we examine our lives and say, God, is there any way in my life, any place in my life that I have moved outside of who you are? Outside of your, your intended pleasure, your intended will, your intended purpose, outside of that. I don't want to live outside of that. God has purposed each one of us to live in his kingdom. In him is his kingdom. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 also tells us that there's things that he has for us to do. There's things that he has for you and I to do, not to be saved, but when we live there, there's this purpose. There's these things that God has called us to do. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, it says this. It says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So let's use the middle section analogy here again, where like, hey, this, these two sections, they are purposed to accomplish this. They're purposed to look like this. They're purposed to flow in victory and freedom and look like this. They're purposed to, to encounter challenges in life and overcome and rise above those challenges because my spirit is here empowering them to do so. There's this place in God, in Christ, in his kingdom, and we can choose. It's our choice that either puts us there or not. It's up to you. Tell your neighbor it's up to you. Thanks for preaching with me here this morning. You know, many of you know that we spent the last many years in Africa, and so we just got really used to people preaching with us. <laughs> so uh, thank you for kind of going along with me this morning when I ask you to to talk. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 14, and this is one of the scriptures that in, you know, back in Bible school and Bible college that really just gripped my heart, um, and one of the scriptures that I really felt like God started to give me revelation on uh, for the first time that I really felt was like, man, this is, uh, he's unpacking stuff in my spirit, and I just want to read through here verses 7 to 14 of Philippians chapter 3. It says this, it says, but what things were gained to me? This is Paul talking, okay? The Apostle Paul, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, says, But what things were gained to me? These I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. So this is, this is the Apostle Paul. He, I mean, he's like the missionary extraordinaire, right? He is the apostle <laughs> uh, going to the Gentiles. And, he is, and he's like, listen, I, I am living my life in such a way that my hope, my prayer, that I may be found in him. Not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. And that word know is the Greek word gnosko. It's, it's, it's this word that says to know by intimate knowledge. It's the same way that Adam knew Eve and, and you know, Cain was born. Uh, but that it's, it's to know him by intimate knowledge. That, listen, I, I want to know him. Not only just know him, but the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended it, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. 
Paul's desire here was to be found in him. And I was like, God, what is it? What is it in you? What is so attractive, God, in you that made Paul? Now, you have to remember who Paul was. You know, he was Saul. He had, like, prestigious friends, okay? He had influence. His family, he knew the high priest. They had money, okay? So Paul, who had everything, he had influential friends, had money, he had a very respected education, he had a very uh, respected status in society, all of a sudden, he encounters Christ, and there's something in him that says, I give it all up. I give it all up just to know him. I will become the dregs of society just to know him and to be found in him. There's something so beautiful, something so, uh, so much more that is in him than all of the world has to offer me. And that's really, you know, when we talk about Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, last week we talked about it, about seek first the kingdom of God, and then all these things will be added unto you, you know, where there's this place of like, I give up the seeking for all of these things that the world seeks after, and I seek him, and in that place, I, you know, I pursue him, and then I turn around, and those things start to follow. Those things start to follow, the, the things that my heavenly Father knows that we need. The Bible says there. And so Paul, you know, he has this revelation. He has this encounter with Jesus, and he's like, man, this is, this is worth giving everything up. This is worth the sacrifice of my life, my, you know, my perception in other people's eyes. I don't care. And he's, he, he, he takes that leap in following Christ. He found the pearl of great price for his life. And he sold all he had and went and bought the field. There's an invitation for you and I to buy the field, to sell everything we have in order to buy the field. I want to talk about salvation. If you can go ahead and put that slide up there. Um, there we go. I want to talk about salvation here this morning and give a visual representation of what the Bible talks about salvation to be. Okay? So, I'm going to... See if I have, would you just be able to advance that for me? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> we are not scripted. So uh, forgive my rudimentary drawing uh, this morning, but this is not your stock portfolio, okay? Uh, this is a visual representation of the principles of salvation that the Bible talks about for you and I to understand. You can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Here on, the, on your left, we have creation, the beginning of time, the beginning of mankind's relationship with God and how Adam and Eve and mankind walked with God in the garden. And what was the purpose of mankind in that time? They, they were working with God. They were working with him to name the animals, to see the structures, you know, of, of the world set up. They reigned <laughs> with the Lord. And then the enemy, the devil, came and led a rebellion against God and tricked mankind. And sin entered the world because of obedience to the, to the words of Satan, to the words of the enemy. And what happened? The fall. Okay? We get that there? The fall of mankind, where we fell from relationship with God. We fell from relationship from the one who knew who we are and why we exist, the one who created us and has uh, wonderful desires for you and I. We fell from that relationship. We lost purpose. We lost identity, and we lost our connection to everyone uh, and the things that were created around us. And then Jesus... Because of his great love for which he loved us, he came and he paid the price for your sin, for the wrong things you've done, the wrong things I've done, right? And so we see the cross, and the cross brings us back to relationship with our Heavenly Father instantaneously. But then what? Do we just like disappear? No. You still, we still get to live our life, right? We still get to live here. We're, we're saved for a purpose. 
And so that is the picture of redemption and then continued on into eternity with relationship. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. The redemption of the cross, the redemption of Jesus Christ is this big term called justification, which means just as if you had never fallen into sin, just as if you had never sinned. That's what the Bible talks about as being justified, that God, because, of his rich, because he is rich in mercy, he comes and he justifies us and he washes us clean and there is the principle of justification. We'll say a little bit more about that in the future. Go ahead, next slide, thank you. Then the journey that we go on after justification, after we be, become what many t- people term saved, okay, there is a journey that we walk on. Theologically, that's called sanctification. Now, the word sanctification means to be set apart. It means to be, be made holy. It's a process. Tell your neighbor, say, a process. All right, cool. Cool. And then the next slide, go ahead, is glorification, which is uh, the renewal of our, of our body. So uh, and let me talk about that in a second. So let's just back up here. Justification is instant. It's at the point where you place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and you say, I give my life to you and I accept your life. There's this great exchange. God, I give up my life to you, my messed up, sin-filled life. I give it to you and I accept the work that you've done to justify me, to make me clean. And instantaneously, the Holy Spirit comes and brings spiritual life to your spirit. The Holy Spirit comes and breathes life, and your spirit man is made alive. But all of a sudden, you don't just like, that's it, you fall over dead or get raptured. No, that's, that's just the start. Tell your neighbor, say, it's just the start. Right. right, and so there's, you know, there's, there's verses and scriptures in the Bible that talk about justification, that talk about this part of salvation Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's talking about justification. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth one confesses unto salvation. Romans 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, it talks about this as well. It says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, has made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, so there's, there's portions that when the Bible talks about salvation, it's talking about justification. There's also, now this is sometimes where people get confused, because, you know, back up a little bit where Paul's talking in Philippians, where he says, man, that I may know him. I mean, Paul's already saved at that point, right? He's already given his life to Jesus, but he is striving for something. He is going for something in God that to live in him and to, to, know, to know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, you know, to, that he may attain the resurrection of that. There's goals, the things that Paul has that says, listen, it, it, I've, I'm, yes, I've already given my life to Jesus, but I, there's things I want to experience in him. I'm not just saved from something. I'm saved for something. Amen? And so the, the Apostle Paul, he's talking, and, and, and when, when we can look at that and say, like, man, what is he talking about? Like, he's talking as if he hasn't attained it already. I mean, he's saved, but what is he talking about? And he's actually talking about the process here of sanctification, the journey with the Lord, that, that if you've given your life to Jesus Christ on, and you're sitting here this morning, you are on that sanctification journey. And the Bible speaks to us in terms of, Using the same, the same language of being saved in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 and 9, it says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, you and I, our faith will be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ 
whom having not seen you love, though now you do not yet see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The salvation of your souls. So justification is the salvation of your spirit. Your spirit man is made alive. Sanctification is the, is the process that you and I go through for the salvation of our souls, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. That's what your soul is. It's the journey that we walk on in our lives with the Lord. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 11 talks about this. It says, for both he who sanctifies, which is God, and those who are being sanctified, you and I, are all one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. I don't know about you, but I haven't made it yet. Amen? Amen. Like, yes, there's this place of being fully alive in Christ, but there's also this journey that I got to get up in the morning. I mean, maybe y'all are a little bit more holy than I am, but like, I got to get up in the morning, and I still got to choose to forgive, and I still got to like put on my big boy pants. <laughs> Anyone else? <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and deal with life. <laughs> and that's the journey that you and I walk on. With the Lord, where we, that, this is the importance of knowing his word, of being led by his spirit, of not letting doubt like reign in our hearts, because this is the, the journey that you and I go on, is this journey of being sanctified, where we are being set apart, and our soul, our mind, our will, and emotions is wrestling with the principles and the word of God being brought into alignment with Christ. All right? Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14 also talks about, it says, for by one offering, which was the cross, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So Jesus has already perfected you, yet it is still being worked out. It's called the after-before principle, <laughs> where God has already done it, yet we are seeing it worked out in our lives. And it's up to you and I whether or not we will get, whether or not we walk in that. Whether or not we want to be in the middle, in the middle section is up to you and I. All right? Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 talks about this. It says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not just in, the pres in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For, if, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Paul is writing this to people who are already born again. Those who are already saved. They're already justified. They've given their life to Jesus. They're pursuing him. They're following him. And their spirit man is made alive. But then he tells them, listen, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Work out God's will, his will for you to do and his will for what he wants you to be focused on. Work that out. Wrestle with that. And that's that journey of sanctification, all right? Sanctification is learning to be and remain in him. Which is why, like, many times when we give our lives to Jesus, maybe we come to an altar, maybe we pray a prayer, maybe we just cry out, God, help, <laughs> you know? We give our lives to him, we still have to get up the next morning. But all of a sudden, what happens is, as we are in him, we are empowered to walk out his will and his purpose. What happens is we are brought back, by justification, we're brought back to the place where Adam and Eve were with God in the garden. We're brought back to that place, and now there's something for us to do. All right? And go on to the final there, glorification. Glorification is the final and complete restoration when we, when we literally receive. So he said justification is the salvation of our spirit man. Sanctification is the salvation of our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. And glorification is the salvation of our bodies. 
when we receive a glorified body, resurrected body, free from sin and its effects. And that happens in the end when Jesus comes. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 21, it says, Who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is, is able even to subdue all things to himself? 1 John 3, verse 2 says, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 54 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, so that when this corruptible has been put on, uh, so when this corruptible, corruption, excuse me, man, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Amen? Amen? That is the principle of glorification. Now, when the Bible talks about this, it talks in, when it talks about salvation and being saved, it talks about all three of these principles, justification, sanctification, and glorification. All three of them is the total picture of salvation. Okay? So you, you, get to deter, you get to see by the context of, of what Scripture is what it's talking about. Is it talking about the salvation of our souls where we're wrestling through our own salvation? You know, this isn't, this, um, I'm giving, I'm wanting to give you a visual to hang, a framework to hang the understanding that we are not, you know, there's scriptures that people try and pull to say you are predetermined to go to hell or to heaven or salvation by works. No, you know, there, even though people use those, use different scriptures about how to be saved by works or how to be saved by God's predetermination, all of that kind of thing. No, it's actually talking about these three areas of salvation. Instantaneous, the process, and the final. Okay? So you are purposed by God to be in Christ from the foundation of the world. When God dreamed of you. See, not, there's not one of us. God did not, um, he did not, he does not, have dreams for you outside of himself. He gives giftings. But there was, God's heart was for mankind to never fall. And when mankind did fall from relationship with him, he provided a way back. And his desire is for you and I to be walking with him. Many people have this question, do I have a destiny? In Christ, yes, you do. The next question that many people say is like, what is my destiny? It probably has a lot to do with like who you are, your giftings, how God has made you, all of these things, what desires are inside of you, what desires he's placed inside of you, the opportunities that you have in life. But destiny is not a straight line from point A to point B. Many times people think that, like, oh, if I don't get this decision right, I'm going to miss my destiny. You know, I'm going to miss the things that God has purposed for me. It's more like, uh, if we could explain it, it's kind of like a general direction, okay? Where if we wanted to leave and get on a plane here and fly to Los Angeles, at this point, at this far away, we pretty much just have to get, you know, head west by southwest, Right? We just need to kind of head that direction. And it's not like the, bear, the heading that you get on as you leave Harrisburg International Airport, which I don't know if has any international flights coming in and out of, come to think of it. But, uh, you know, like, it's not about that heading. It's about getting started and heading the general direction of west by southwest. And the closer you get to Los Angeles, then the more important these decisions become. And that's kind of how our destiny in God is, is it's not like I wake up one morning, I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to miss it if I don't like, get this step right. No, just start walking. 
the direction that you sense, that, that you feel led to do. Like, go in that direction. That's probably going to bring start heading you towards your destiny in God. All right? It's broad to narrow, that the closer you get to a specific point, the more important is the, the, the uh, decisions that you make in your life. So destiny is not a straight line. It's kind of, it's that don't be bound by the fear of missing it. Just start, go for it, follow God, do what you know to do, do what's like clear for you to walk in, uh, in the Bible. All right, there's, there's a, um, we talked about the good works that he has prepared for us beforehand to do in Ephesians chapter two. And that's kind of like in, in his will, he has prepared good works for us to do. But the thing is, you and I have to choose whether or not we're going to do them. It's our choice. You and I have to choose. Like, cue the uh, Mission Impossible music. Dun, dun, this is your mission, should you choose to accept it. You know, like, that's the, that's the idea that the Bible gives to us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand and that we should walk in them. You know, I, I, I cringe when, like, People are clearly walking outside of the will of God, you know, in their lives and the will of, I mean, just the, like the general will that you can perceive in Scripture, not the, you know, not the specific will for each individual. But, you know, there's people who walk outside of that and then, they're, then they claim to have a moral, you know, claim against God. And it's like, why, you know, why does God allow suffering? Why does God do this in my life? Why does God, you know, not do that? And I'm like, well, you're not walking in, within the boundaries of his will and his word and his way. You know, and so there, you know, there's these things that the Bible actually makes assumptions. <gasps> the Bible makes assumptions about you and I. And this is the last part before we, we head off here to the, to the end of, the, of my message here. I want to go through some of the things that the Bible assumes about you when you follow Jesus. The Bible assumes some things about me. When I follow Jesus, Matthew chapter six, verses two and three, I'm just going to read through them real quickly. We're not going to put them up there, but it says, when you do charitable deeds, it doesn't say if you do charitable deeds, it says when you do charitable deeds, there's an assumption that when you follow Christ, you will do charitable deeds, right? Okay. It says in Luke 11, verses two and four, many other places, when you pray, the assumption is that when you follow Christ, you will be a person of prayer, all right? Matthew 6, verse 16 and 17. I love this one because we all love it, right? It says, when you fast, ah, <laughs> when you fast, not if you fast, when you fast, all right? So there's the assumption is that when we're following Christ, we would be people who intentionally sacrifice the comfort of food in order to be hungry for the Lord. Wow. Okay, another assumption, Mark chapter 13, verse 7, it says, well, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be troubled. In other words, you're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Don't be troubled by it. Don't be troubled by it, because the end is not yet, it says. You know, you're going to hear it, but don't get caught up in the troubling signs. It's, the end is not yet. Don't be troubled, okay, which means you're going to have an opportunity to be troubled. So don't be troubled. All right. Luke chapter 12, verses 58, it says, when you, go to the, to you, <laughs> when you go with your adversary, you know, you and I are going to have adversaries. Shoot. <laughs> you know, it's not just easy cream and mashed potatoes. You know, it's, you know, or, or strawberries and, and, and whipped cream or whatever it is. You know, like, our, we're going to have adversaries and there's a responsibility, there's an assumption by the word of God that, listen, as you're following Jesus and you have adversaries, work it out quickly. Before you get hauled into the judge. <laughs> All right? All right, so there's, these are some of the assumptions that it makes. I love this one. Luke 14, verse 8, it says, when you attend a wedding. <laughs> In other words, we're supposed to be attending weddings and celebrations. Come on. God has made us to enjoy life. We're, you know, you know uh, of course, the reference there is, is, you know, don't take the seat of high honor, give it to somebody else, honor somebody else, and you'll be honored, you know, later. But, the, 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 you know, the point is, the assumption is that we're going to be attending weddings. We're going to be attending celebrations. Come on, that's good. All right, Luke 14, verses 12 to 13, it says, when you throw a feast, man, we should be party animals <laughs> in a good sense. 
When you, you know, the assumption is, listen, you know, the, 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 that you, when you throw a feast, when you throw a party, some, some of you, your stress levels just went up. It's okay. All right. Throw feasts and throw parties, but then also invite those who could never invite you back. All right. Luke 16, verse 9 says, when you fail. Oh, I hate that one. In other words, the Bible assumes that you and I are going to have times in our lives where we fail. We're not perfect. That's right. It says when you fail, and it actually talks about like making friends with unrighteous money, with unrighteous mammon, so that when you fail, they may receive you into, into an eternal inheritance. There's this place of saying, listen, there's going to be things we do in our lives that we will not always be successful and that we're going to have to have contingency plans in our lives. Okay? That's the assumption of Scripture about you and I because it knows who we are. But you know what? God is walking with us in these things. Amen? 1 Corinthians 11.33 says, gather together to eat. Come on. Anyone getting hungry? <laughs> gather together to eat. Hebrews 12.5, listen to the chastening and the correction of the Lord. The assumption is that you will be chastened by the Lord. You will be corrected by the Lord. Don't run from it. Listen to it. All right? James 1 verses 2 says, count it all joy. When you fall into various trials. Man, we will, we will have trials. We will have challenges. But count it joy. The decision is to count it joy. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 2 says, With the weapons of our warfare. You have a warfare to wage. You and I, we have a warfare to wage. All right? Be a warrior. Be a warrior <clears throat> in God. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. Ephesians 6, 13 to 18 also talks about that, putting on the full armor of God. Man, why you put on armor? Because you're going to fight. You're going to fight. There is a war for you to wage. A lot of the times it's in our mind, all right? But there is a war to wage. <clears throat> they overcame the devil. You know, Revelation talks about they overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies. Share your testimonies. The assumption is that you will share your testimonies of what God is doing Basically, we see the heart of God for us to pursue relationship with him as our highest goal and then fully enjoy the life that he created us to have. Amen? We have both the great commandment and the great commission. You are purposed by God for relationship in him and with him. You are purposed by God in relationship with him and to grow in it. You are purposed by God to live your life in him, which means to be inside of his purpose, inside of his plan, inside of his design, inside of his pleasure for your life. Listen, that's the sweet spot of our lives. When we are there, God knows what, you know, back to the message of last week, God knows how to, what makes us tick and what makes us ticked. And there's many times that I know in my life that if I would have my way I wouldn't be, you know, the, my plans would not lead me to the fulfillment that I desire. But God is able to, to bring about his plans, and all of a sudden I'm like, man, there's just no other place I'd rather be. There's just no other place I'd rather be. Like, this is so fulfilling. God, how, how, can, how is it that you've privileged me to be able to be here at this time, at this place? Like, God, I, I could not have orchestrated this. And that's what, the, that's what living in the Lord does for us. Can we stand together? If you're here today and you recognize that, oh, back, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Is that the last slide? You can go to the next one. So justification is our spirit man instantly born again. Sanctification is our soul and that's the process. Glorification is our body, and that's finished, uh, the finished work of Christ. And that whole area there is what the Bible talks about when it talks about salvation. So my question to you is, where are you in that picture? Where are you today in that picture? Have you given your life to him, but you've kind of left his way? Are you trying to live your life outside of him? Have you given your life to him? 
Are you pursuing him but not understanding the wrestle that you're going through because of the journey that you're on? Because maybe you've thought like, well, this shouldn't be. Like, I've, it should be instant. This, you know, the Bible talks about salvation and I'm saved and now I'm in the kingdom. And like, what, what's the wrestle? It's, it's because we're in a process of sanctification, of being made holy, of, being, of, of walking with the Lord. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, today we come to you. I thank you for your word that speaks life to us. I thank you for the understanding that you've given of our relationship with you through your word, God. I thank you for the understanding that you've given of how we can be walking with you in our lives. And God, I pray today for those who are here who maybe have not understood where they're standing in their journey with you. God, uh, we, we, we thank you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. God, we thank you, Lord, that as we are walking in a journey with you, of falling, getting back up, falling, getting back up, and, and working things out and wrestling out, Father, I thank you, Lord, that there's no condemnation in Jesus' name. I thank you, Lord, that you are not here to condemn us. You're not here to make us feel guilty or ashamed. But, Lord, we thank you that your saving life and the power of the Holy Spirit is present with us to walk us into relationship with you in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for your victory. I thank you for your life. I thank you, Father, how you have made us so that we have brought us back to the place that Adam and Eve had with you, just as if we have never sinned. Thank you, God, that you walk with us. You're committed, more committed to us than we are to you. God, and I thank you, Lord, for every person here. I thank you that it's not an accident that they're here today. I thank you, God, for victory. I thank you, Lord, for... I, I ask, God, that you would reignite hearts that have grown dim in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you, Lord, for vision to come again. I thank you, Lord, for purpose to come again. Thank you that you have purposed us to live in the glory-rich environment of your kingdom. And God, we come today in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can the prayer ministers come, those who are on the prayer minister team? We're going to have... Uh, some prayer ministers up here. If you would like prayer for anything, uh, you are welcome to come and receive prayer. But uh, I just, I really want to put this question out there. If you recognize that you are not living in him, <laughs> in Christ, you know, maybe you've received him even, but you have, you're not like dedicated to following him and living in him, in that I want to invite you to make that step today and say, God, today, you know, the, the, the amazing thing about the Father is no matter how far we go, the Bible talks about that the grace of God is able to bring those who are far near. And how, no matter how far we go, it's one step back. It's one step back in relationship with him. And so I know I talked about a lot of different things this morning, but that's really the gist that you and I are purposed to be living in the kingdom of God, in him. And if you recognize that you've been trying to live your life outside of that, I want to invite you to come and get prayer. It's just one step back to the Father to, to decide to pursue him again with all of our hearts. Amen? Go and have a powerful week. Go. You're anointed and called by God. Uh, have a blessed week this week. And, man, I want to invite you to do some of those things that the Bible assumes about you. Throw parties. Have fun. <laughs> eat together. Uh, push through difficult things. Pray for one another. Uh, and those are some practical things we can do this week. Amen? God bless you. Thank you for being